now and for future pandemics. Uh, a few things, you'll see the, the agenda just below me, and you have the messaging wall, wall to your right. Actually, please use the messaging wall. I'd like you to tell me where you're tuning into from. You know, write the name of your city and see, and see where our, uh, our people are tuning into from today. All right. So we want you, we want you to be as active as possible today. We, you were very active in, in, our first, uh, in our first webinar. Please continue to do so. The questions and comments you, you type in are useful for your colleagues and also useful for, for us because we can use some of those questions and comments for our keynote speakers throughout the session. If you want to get into uh, a full screen mode, there's an expand button at the bottom right of your screen. So let's see how well you guys are doing. We know from where are you tuning into? Anybody, is anybody out there? We're getting a bit of a delay, but hey, while I look at, at uh, the, the answers coming in, we'll, I'll be right back and we'll start with uh, the, the, full and the full program of the show. See you in just 30 seconds. Healthcare is being overrun by the digital revolution. Artificial intelligence and personal health monitoring are transforming the way illnesses are diagnosed. Finland is at the forefront of this revolution, rethinking healthcare and pushing innovations. But why Finland? How did a small country like us become a global leader in digital health? Well, it's literally in our genes. Not only are we creative and full of ideas, but we have a unique and isolated gene pool. 100% of our patient records are in electronic format, and soon, half a million Finns will have their genomes analyzed. And we are open. International researchers have access to our world-class health data, including lifelong patient records, imaging data, and full traceability. Test beds allow health tech companies to develop services in an authentic hospital environment. And all this with a high level of security. Finland is also home to groundbreaking startups. Osgenic creates virtual environments where surgeons can prepare for operations safely. Their aim is to prevent costly errors in surgery. Another pioneering startup, Nigen, provides a risk assessment for chronic diseases. The test combines genome-wide analysis with lifestyle risk factors. Finland is an ideal place for research and innovation for many leading international companies. GE Healthcare develops wearable technology in Finland, and Bayer combines its long experience in life science with the cutting-edge know-how of the local tech startups. So why Finland? We enjoy the world's best ecosystem for health research and development. We have world-class professionals and technology companies, access to health data, plus a legislation that supports the secondary use of the data in research and innovation. We believe in world-changing ideas and turning them into global success stories. Finland works for us. Now let it work for you. Business Finland. World Ideas. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome aboard to this Health at Sea, COVID-19, Mitigation Through Ship Design and Solutions on Board. My name is André Noël Chacquer, and I have the great pleasure and honor of being the moderator of this very important event for the maritime industry. As you can see from the, uh, from the agenda below your screen, we have four very knowledgeable speakers who will soon shed some light on some of the solutions and technologies that can mitigate the spread and negative impact of COVID-19. Uh, this is our, our second virtual event uh, on this important topic of health at sea. We're happy to see so many of you here today. I understand that we have a few more people that, today than we had last time, so that the trend is excellent. And as with our first event, we want this webinar to be as interactive as possible. So, first thing is our hashtags, and I think you see them on the messaging wall uh, on your screen. So, hashtag health at sea and hashtag Finland works. I've already posted my first pictures of our, with our first speakers on, the, on our feed. So, uh, we also encourage you to use the messaging fu function if the feed window is on your right, you know, to send comments and questions so that we can use those when we talk with our speakers and, uh, and our keynote speakers later on. 
Uh, this event will be recorded and will be made available for you afterwards uh, for your reference. Our aim today is to leave you with ideas, solutions, and innovations in vessel design and operations for better and healthier sea travel and the economic resilience and recovery of the maritime industry. Today, we will be highlighting some of the unique technological and design solutions from Finnish companies that are developing and implementing to mitigate the health challenges we face today in this industry. So, we will also have polling opportunities uh, to ask you questions interactively. And why don't we take our first polling question now? This is one for all of you, and we are creating a word cloud with this one. So you answer with only one or two words. So what new technology or, sol or solutions do you think will be the most significant for the marine industry in dealing with the pandemic? I'm looking for a technology, a solution in one or two words that you believe will be the most valuable in tackling the challenges we face with COVID-19 and, and future pandemics. So I'm going to let you create that cloud and we're going to continue with you know, this by telling you that this event, again, as last, the last event is uh, organized jointly by Business Finland and the Finnish marine industries. Um, you know, the last few months have been very challenging for people all over the world. But it also has been a period of intense scientific and technological development. The pace of the race to find health and digital business solutions has never been this intense. This is also the case for the marine industry. And today, we will be looking at some of the cutting edge technologies that can improve the resilience and the, of the resilience of the entire industry during this pandemic and beyond. We will now have two speakers present their experience and solutions in the field of ship modifications and design. We will listen to both of them uh, before we ask them questions. Uh, so do please send your questions and comments uh, on both presentations and we'll take them or take some of your questions when we talk to them after they have both spoken. Um, ladies and gentlemen, our, um, our first speaker is a marine industry visionary. Uh, we had the pleasure, as you, some of you remember, I'm having the grand old man of Finnish shipbuilding, Martin Sarikangas, join our webinar uh, last year, uh, at our last webinar. And we, have, we are de absolutely delighted today to have another great veteran of the industry join us. Uh, he has the kind of experience and leadership that should help us navigate the, um, the rough waters of the current pandemic. Uh, he'll be talking today about modifications that can mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Please welcome the CEO of the Helsinki Shipyards, Carl Gustav Rodkirch. Welcome. Terve tuloa. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yes. Uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, good morning to some of you and good afternoon to some of you. Uh, uh, this is a uh, very interesting uh, topic we are talking about today and uh, in fact I'll take some uh, time to recap what was discussed about a month ago. Uh, so uh, COVID, of course, it's our common enemy. Uh, it will require global measures and uh, solutions. It spreads throughout the world and is still in our midst. Uh, symptoms vary from mild to severe illness uh, or no symptoms at all. Uh, and we have no uh, vaccination, no cure that, has pro uh, that is proven to, to be effective yet. Uh, guidance and policies and uh, procedures are under development. So what did we do uh, at the previous webinar? That was on the 17th of uh, June. And uh, the question was, uh, how is COVID uh, transmitted? Uh, the next question was, uh, what response measures uh, could be applied? Uh, third question, uh, what guidelines for restoration of transport uh, services are underway? And uh, then the same concerning maritime specific economic measures to help restoration. And finally, uh, Martin Sarikangas uh, was asked the question, will the cruise industry recover? Uh, his 
answer was a resounding yes. So what did we learn during that uh, webinar? Uh, first of all, six months uh, into the pandemic, there is still a lot to learn. The ways of transmission are several, uh, but obviously through close contact with an infectious uh, person uh, through droplet transmission, including aerosol transmission uh, or through surface uh, transmission. The quick fix is uh, measures for more hygienic behavior, social distancing, masks, washing hands and surfaces, uh, which means uh, mainly operational measures. To date, more focus has naturally been on operational measures because they are uh, quicker to apply. But uh, how should we proceed from now on then? The next steps in technology development, and that's where uh, I will focus a little more. Uh, for more long-term measures, uh, some technologies exist, some are under development, and some innovations are still needed. None of them alone will be the solution. Together, they will reduce the risk for transmission. So we're talking about uh, kind of 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.5 and so on until we get down to an acceptable uh, level of risk. Uh, without uh, the vaccine, I think this is just my guess, uh, without that we will not uh, totally be able to mitigate. Uh, health and sanitation uh, technology improvement and operational measures uh, combined will have to be the new normal in the industry. The Finnish maritime cluster contains an impressive number of companies representing ready technologies in this field, and more is developing. Around, um, I think it was around uh, the Eastern time, uh, the brochure uh, started, we started to develop the brochure about what technology uh, is available in Finland. And uh, I must say it was quite impressive to find what was going on in, in the Finnish industry. So Finnish shipyards and technology companies uh, have solutions against uh, COVID-19 and uh, I'll just quickly go through how uh, I think we will uh, get to uh, apply them and, and uh, what uh, technologies uh, would exist that we can offer. So first of all, uh, shipyard is, is a key player in fighting against uh, COVID-19. Uh, the shipyard has customer contact and negotiations. Uh, the shipyard's role as a door opener for new solutions and uh, safer technologies are uh, imminent, especially when we talk about new buildings. Uh, offering for the customer, uh, highlighting the importance of safe technology and health solutions on board. Uh, we have uh, in the yards dedicated and competent designers and uh, close contacts with the institutes and universities in, uh, that ensure knowledge about new innovations and, and uh, developments. So this, this uh, would be the, the uh, shipyard. The technologies uh, and the companies uh, providing technology, uh, digitalization, artificial intelligence, uh, healthcare solutions. Uh, there we have uh, uh, we, we the Finnish uh, marine industry is known to be forerunners in developing and implementing new and innovative uh, technologies. Digital technology, smart ships, smart ports. The fewer human contacts, the less risks. And uh, tests are going on in 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 the Finnish waters. Uh, concerning smart ships and uh, smart uh, ports, as some of you may know. Uh, digital uh, transformation is here to stay. That's another uh, thing we have learned during 
these months. COVID-19 has shown the importance of technology and in many cases has sped up digital transformation. They say, I don't know, but they say by five to six percent. Sounds like a high number, but uh, on the other hand, I can believe it. <laughs> uh, uh, Data-based uh, cleaning, uh, lo looking at uh, uh, the, the frequency of cleaning and, and uh, controlling that is one possibility. Uh, new apps of different kinds, platforms for monitoring health status, medical services without physical contacts. Uh, the list is long, and uh, we could go on for, for quite a uh, lot more. So, uh, continuing uh, with, with uh, let's say, the hard uh, uh, technologies that prevent COVID-19 spreading. Uh, first of all, and I could see it on, on uh, the answers that you gave on the cloud, you're all talking a bit and, and quite frequently about uh, the cleaner air uh, needed on board, and that's, that's a vital condition. Uh, UVC filters and blue light radiation, waste-free filter methods, uh, cloud-connected air purification uh, con technology, and low turbulent flow solutions for ultra-clean operation environments. Uh, except clean air, innovative uh, solutions for hygiene, materials, equipment, furniture, etc. exist. Hygiene, data-based cleaning with, uh, to fight viruses and bacteria. Materials, uh, high-quality wear-resistant interior decorative uh, materials like, for example, stainless steel and panels. Equipment, blue light technology and catalytic uh, coatings. Furniture. The world's first antimicrobial furniture collection cuts down the spread and reproduction of microbes. Communication on board, new apps, platforms for monitoring health status, broadcasting alerts and notifications. Uh, uh, just uh, kind of an add to the end here. Uh, there is much uh, to learn in this booklet that uh, already has been introduced to you. So uh, talking about, uh, let's say, chrono uh, chronological order of how to fight uh, COVID, the importance, of course, as every emergency uh, is of early actions that we learned uh, already. So. Uh, the effective tool to prevent spread of COVID-19 is to test, trace, isolate, and treat. Then uh, also it's important to stop the virus already ashore. So shipping companies, uh, pre-boarding procedures are important, clear instructions for the uh, crew and passengers, training, implement new technologies and innovations in port, uh, for example, machine vision in test. Uh, some of you may have seen that uh, only last week there was a, uh, news in, in the papers about uh, this machine vision test uh, in, in uh, Finland. The test machine measures fever, checks if the person uses mask, and doses hand sanitizer. This all, uh, of course, helps in, in uh, not needing to, to uh, use too much manpower to, to do these controls. Then uh, uh, the guidance uh, worldwide is developing. Uh, EU are working hard on it. IMO is working, CDC. And uh, then we have something that uh, has been called IMO MARTEC where MARTEC stands for, in this case, it stands for M, meters and masks, maintain the uh, SSD uh, shipboard uh, self-distancing uh, or social distancing, whatever you call it, assess 
assess the risks via, via formal and well-documented risk assessments, reduce the sp spread, uh, isolate the infected personnel, and the well-documented risk, uh, sorry, and, and test uh, peers in, in contact with them. Test, test before and after embarking or with suspected uh, COVID cases. Educate, inform everyone and master of confirmed cases and ensure uh, protocol to follow is understood. Keep records, temperatures twice daily and all movements with seven days of pre or post boarding. So if something happens anyway, in case the corona finds its way to the vessel, uh, despite all preventive measures done, there are still smart solutions that help the crew and operators uh, to manage the situation. And uh, uh, for disinfection, we have UV uh, radiation, LED technology, even cannons uh, for large areas. Emergency response dis disinfection, ozone cleaning cabinets, etc. Sanitation solutions for air, water, and surfaces, equipment for personal protection like respirators, telehealth solutions for remote medical services, for taking care of the patient, isolation pods, marine health uh, care products, and hospital equipment. I lose my breath uh, listing all these uh, technologies and ways and, and uh, measures we can, we can take into use. And uh, I think uh, for us all it, it will be a matter of prioritizing and making the right choices. So, summing up, fighting the COVID-19 uh, requires a concerted effort. The shipyard perspective for, forms a vehicle to apply known uh, technologies. So far, there are technologies to re reduce risk, but uh, not to mitigate it. Operationally, an industry standard will be and is emerging. As we gain more experience, we will learn new ways to fight the disease and reduce the risks. Uh, sanitation technology on ships has been improved for decades. In the 80s, I was in, uh, involved in the U.S. public health uh, inspection uh, practices and, and uh, learned a lot on that. Uh, we have probably something similar uh, in front of us today. So we have to prepare, to prepare to learn more and to innovate. And since we have 31 seconds left, I'll just uh, uh, use a possibility to tell you about our new uh, expedition vessel, which uh, the start of the production was on the 27th of, of uh, April. We will have a keel laying in a few weeks and uh, on the Vega, the features against COVID-19, uh, the first one was a uh, decision to install the UV filters in the air conditioning. Uh, considerations that uh, still are uh, on its way. The operational procedures will be the key for the operator. Industry standards for both procedures and technologies are emerging quickly. Solutions can in include antibacterial materials and so on, and uh, more as we learn. So, thank you very much. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about those new, uh, those new vessels. Uh, Kalle, I believe that's what they call you, Kalle, isn't that right? Uh, right. At, 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 the sh at, yes. at the shipyard, yeah. Um, it's got, it really fascinating work that you're doing at the Helsinki shipyard, and we're very excited for, for Finland, for you, and for the work that you're doing. And we're, we're getting set up for, for our, our next very exciting presentation. Uh, many of you know our, our next speaker, and especially his company. You know, our, our, next, our next speaker represents a company that is the world's most, perhaps the, most, the world's most reputable naval architect and engineering company. This is the company most people in the industry go to when they have a challenging, a challenging situation where they need innovation in ship design.
Our speaker is a well-known ship energy and design expert. He'll, uh, he'll present us with uh, some considerations for future, future ship design. He is the head of new technology at Forship. He is Jan Erik Rasanen. Welcome, Tervetuloa. Thank you. Very impressive introduction. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it, it, it feels uh, relatively strange to stand uh, in front of all of you and uh, not seeing you, which is uh, very un uncommon for me, I would say. Uh, let's see. Today we have uh, an introduction and discussion regarding uh, our project Hygieia and uh, shortly just uh, why Forship would be uh, an excellent partner in also uh, these type of items uh, in, in addition to our normal naval architecture and, and marine, marine design. Uh, over the years, uh, more than 2,000 completed projects, so, and uh, we are specialized in, in uh, the passenger ship segment and uh, mainly the cruise industry. And you can see some of our customers on, on, on the bottom, bottom part of, uh, of the screen. Uh, founded 2002, and uh, today uh, roughly 110 employees. Uh, we were on a good track record of uh, future growth before the pandemic and uh, say when uh, when things uh, started to go uh, you could say do down the drain uh, in March March early April uh, we, we were a little bit shocked that uh, what will actually happen with uh, with the industry that uh, uh, the whole team in, in, in the company loves and uh, the first initial thought was that there is nothing we can do. You know, we, we, we have no knowledge about uh, a pandemic situation and uh, there is uh, a lot of things, of course, to learn. But then uh, we, we started to brainstorm, think that, okay, if we put our heads together and uh, look on uh, what our company actually could do to the industry. and. Uh, but the foremost, we wanted to have, uh, you know, help the industry back on, on, on track and uh, get the ships back in operation. First of all, also, nobody thought that this will uh, drag on for this, this long time. Uh, but today, everybody knows that we don't see a near, near future end, at least. So what we did, uh, we at least uh, came to the conclusion that there is no silver bullet. And as we also heard in, in Carlos' presentation, there is a lot of technologies out there. There is a lot of design, a lot of procedures that you can, can apply. And uh, where we started is uh, a little bit similar as, as uh, from Helsinki Shipyard that uh, don't let the disease on board. So what we call interception. So do whatever you can uh, not to get the disease on board because immediately when it is on board, it's uh, slightly more difficult to, to, uh, to take care of. Then uh, if you have it on board, talk about prevention, so don't let the disease spread. What type of procedures, design, technology is available for, uh, for uh, mitigation uh, and, uh, and such things. And then, uh, of course, isolate the disease. Uh, have, uh, you know, hazardous scenario cards, isolation, do stuff with your medical centers, uh, use technologies to isolate, filtering, and uh, last but not least, at least what we, we saw in the news in, in, in the beginning, that uh, ships are not allowed to enter the ports. And uh, you, a lot of critical cases on board the ships uh, needed uh, of attention and other type of help that they could give on board the ship. So also evacuation is a part of uh, the four-step uh, approach that, that uh, we, we started to evaluate and discuss about and see, okay, what could it actually be? Uh, I, IMO uh, just recently released uh, guidance, especially in, in, in Europe, together with uh, EMSA, European Maritime Safety Agency, 
and the European CDC of uh, what are the steps, risk assessment, risk management. So basically, instead of rushing into go for technology or go for design or go for something, take a few minutes, think, go through a risk assessment, a HACCP or HACCP process, and uh, actually evaluate your ship or your class of ships before you decide on uh, where to go. And the, this, this slide shows uh, the basic process of the initial phase, really the HACCP and the heat maps where we discuss, okay, what kind of impact does this change have on, on my ship, on our, our uh, class of ships, and then based on that uh, evaluate further actions that what should I actually do on board my ship. And then uh, further on, uh, some of the items that is assessed and discussed and agreed upon in, in, in the HACCP goes to a design phase and for modification of, of the ships, either, either looking at it from uh, a new ship perspective that ships which are all still in, in the shipyard, what kind of design changes can and should be applied, and uh, then of course the conversion side as well, where uh, you know look on, on what can be done on my ship, because all, all the ships, uh, even though you could say that they are white or blue or black, uh, they still are, uh, you know, there's some similarities, but a lot of uh, differences as well. So, start with, with uh, risk assessment. Whatever you do, go from a risk assessment perspective. And uh, the risk assessment follows, first we, we were also thinking in, inside our company, the brainstorming sessions, that uh, what do we, how, how do we do it? What would be the, the right approach which is uh, safe, reliable, and has been tried out before? And uh, we came to the conclusion that use the standardized IEC-based uh, HACCP uh, process, the Hazard and Operability Study, and uh, work on it through uh, you know, identifying the four, four different steps that we had, and uh, then look uh, from each angle on the procedures, what, can, what kind of procedures can you do, what kind of design changes do you need to do, and uh, foremost uh, as well assess the technology, because technology is not always the answer. It might be the answer in many cases, but not always. And uh, basically going then, then from, from the HACCP, we go to phase two, which was uh, the feasibility study phase. Again, looking at uh, the procedures from uh, different type of flow. You have luggage flow, terminal operations, uh, the pre-embarkation pre procedures, and um, how do you more, more, more over look on, on uh, the people flow going to restaurants, going from restaurants, uh, what can you do to change those kind of things? And of course, also isolation procedures in case of uh, you have cases on board. Where do you take these uh, um, these persons who are or guests who are who are ill? Uh, how do you make sure that uh, you're actually not uh, contaminating uh, spaces where you walk through and these kind of things? You could also look at it uh, from a design perspective. So, uh, modifying medical centers and uh, also looking then on, on, on that particular item in uh, combination with um, AC design. There's a lot of discussion about uh, the air, the clean air and uh, the recirculation of air. And of course, uh, as I have been working a lot over the years with energy efficiency, this is the least thing I want to see that uh, we are jeopardizing uh, energy efficiency as well from uh, just uh, you know, rushing into making design changes where we have 100% full uh, air exchange. We, we put the last 20 years down the drain, so we need to be smart also on that area. And uh, we could, for example, have um, AC design for regular use, uh, virus mode or quarantine mode, so have more, more smart, intelligent uh, HVAC. 
and uh, that of course lead us to, to technology where um, I think we already had a good good view of, of the technologies which are available and um, so all, all these three things are always uh, they go hand in hand and just as an example from procedures uh, the first uh, HACCP that we conducted with, with the cruise ship uh, say that um, in, in the situation where the industry is today, uh, there is uh, very difficult to get uh, a lot of design changes or, or introduction of new technologies into the ships. So quite a lot of uh, effort is actually put on, on the procedures. How can you, by changing your procedures today, make it more safe both for the crew and the guests? And I think the first, first HACCP we did had uh, roughly 350 input rows and out of those we had 75 recommendations on, on either procedural changes uh, or design changes. Uh, very few of the items or recommendations led to introduction of new technology. It was, uh, it could be done, it was, we were able to you know, find solutions without uh, introducing a lot of new technologies to it. And again, uh, the, say, uh, redesigning uh, an existing medical center by taking some additional cabins, either crew cabins or, or, or uh, say, nobody would like to take guest cabins, but in, in, uh, there might also be event scenarios where you actually need to look on, on, uh, on taking view of, uh, of uh, the revenue stream as well. But again, here, here looking at uh, the design from, uh, from uh, many different angles, either the technology that you have, it, have in it or, or the procedures and uh, the, say the patient transportation route and so on. And uh, the la la latest adventure on, uh, on technology side as I just described in, in my earlier slide, I said that uh, uh, introducing new technologies is, uh, is uh, not always that good. But what if, what if, uh, if uh, all, all the guests, all the crew would uh, wear smart tags operating with, uh, on, on ultra-wide broadband? So not using uh, any other type of Wi-Fi from, from the ship just having the tags, the smart tags that identify you know, each individual guest and crew by, uh, say, anonymous uh, number, so no, no names. And then uh, if you keep yourself to a safe social distance, everything is green. And uh, then again, uh, if you come too close, uh, you can set the social distance uh, freely, basically, from, uh, from one meter, 1.5 and uh, you get either a vibration or you get the sound. But uh, moreover, it is, uh, the main intention is that uh, just keep track on how people flow out on board the ship. And afterwards, uh, the Finnish audience know that there was uh, an incident on one of the ferries a couple of weeks back. Uh, there was one, one infected person traveling on, on board this ferry and then uh, the Finnish government made uh, a press release a few days later saying that, hey, by the way, if you were on board this ship, there was this uh, incident on board, and if you start to feel sick, please go and test yourself. Uh, we, with the use of these smart tags, uh, we can actually identify if, uh, or say, who other uh, guests have been close to this person who was infected and, and uh, ma make it more, more realistic. Instead of sending out press releases, you send a text message to all the people who were not infected or not close to that person. So have, have, having those kind of uh, smart tags, it's also part of uh, the digitalization that we discussed earlier here as well, and uh, use this as uh, a smart way of uh, seeing where you are and uh, who you have been close to. Thank you. Thank you.
you so much, Jan Eric, and that was that was very smart, especially towards the end with the smart tags, smart chips. And now, if you don't mind, let's have a smart discussion yes. with our colleague Kali. Kali, please join us, and let's let's keep ourselves at a good Two distance. Meters. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> we should have the smart. In, in Finland, a meter and a half might be enough, uh, <laughs> and uh, you should give us those tags. They were they, yes. they were very they were very convenient. Uh, I'd like to start our, our discussion by maybe taking a look at the word cloud. If, uh, if you can get me uh, the word cloud now, that would be fantastic. If not, one question that came in early for both of you is a very simple one and something that maybe, maybe we haven't tackled uh, in, in your presentations is that what are the differences between small and mid-sized ships versus large, large sized ships in terms of disease prevention and management? Uh, what, what are the, 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 the scale differences here? And are, are there technology solutions, uh, even procedures that, that make, uh, make one size safer than the other somehow? Uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I start, then we take, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the air conditioning as an example, because uh, I think it was quite high on, on, on the cloud as well. Yeah, show me the cloud uh, again, please. And uh, uh, say that smaller ships tends to have uh, less space available for, uh, for, for technology already as such, right. which means that you, you typically go for uh, a more simple version of uh, the air conditioning, uh, full air circulation. So from, from, from a technology perspective, it, is, it could be much safer on board a small ship than, than again, on, on a large-scale ship where you tend to have a lot of smart uh, uh, recirculation of the air. So looking at it from that angle, it could be better to have a small ship. Yeah. But I also think that a uh, uh, large ship with a lot of uh, guests and crew uh, have more challenge because if the possibilities uh, or uh, looking at it statistically, it's, uh, of course, the risk of having uh, someone with, with, uh, with COVID-19 is higher. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I, I would, I would agree. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if we talk about embarking and, and uh, disembarking, uh, the uh, the ways to to uh, control that process, uh, of course, is is uh, more easily doable with a, a small number of passengers. But, but this is uh, just recording the situation as it is now. Uh, I think that the interest uh, from the cruise industry will be very high to, to uh, invest into developing these procedures in such a way that also the, the uh, big ships will be easy to, to or, or safe to enter and, and uh, disembark. If we can go back uh, to the, the cloud, I'd like to take a, a good look at that cloud because, you know, the cloud works this way that those people who have said the same word or used or thinking about the same technology, that word in the cloud will look larger. Could you give me the, cl could you give me the cloud again, please, uh, on the screen so we can take a look at that? And if, uh, we, if we can't get the cloud, then let's... Oh, there it is. Okay, so at the heart of all of it, we have rapid oh, vaccine is at the heart of being uh, the, the one innovation that we're all waiting for, not only in the maritime industry, but I think in all industries. And in your presentation, Kale, it was quite clear that you believe mm -hmm. that before we have this, it'll be hard to mitigate, if mm -hmm. I understood. Yeah. But then yeah. we have rapid testing, a, a close second, and HVACs. Uh, mm -hmm. We talked about, about ACs. And now, given these, I'd like to go to the question that was a very good one, uh, almost provocative question, if we go back to the list of questions, uh, please, where, uh, you know, given, given what we know, given what we know about the aerosol uh, feature of, of this virus, is, uh, is, uh, social, is, is social distancing essentially pointless? This is from Eric, Eric Schubasberger. Uh, uh, Eric is, is saying, considering the latest information we have on aerosol transmission of COVID-19, do you see social distancing as essentially pointless? What do you think about that? <laughs> I, I don't think it's pointless. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, you know, as, as uh, going, going back a few, few months, uh, everybody thought that uh, aerosol is, is not, uh, so let's say, it's not 
too big risk of, of getting the disease from, from the aerosols. And of course, now we know that the, also the small droplets, they, they you know, attaches to, to things in, in the air. Mm -hmm. So yes, it will spread. But I do believe that uh, it, it's, uh, it has a meaning and it, has, it, it, it is essentially important. Because it, no, not in all 100% cases, but uh, in, in general, I think it, it will make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you made a very good point that is, is, is here also uh, in, in terms of uh, the mobile clean room solutions. And uh, um, you also talked about trade-offs. I mean, we've also made trade-offs with other things that we're trying to tackle in the world climate change, energy consumption, you are one of the world experts on, the, on, this, on this issue, in terms of trade-offs mm. uh, between these solutions. Uh, so obviously if we clean the air all the time, then it's, it's an energy problem. And yeah, then, yeah. you know, what, what are the worst trade-offs that you have seen in, in, terms of, in terms of balancing out these solutions in something that is workable for, for uh, commercial operators? I, I think the, the, the biggest uh, trade-off is... Uh, has nothing to do with technology. It is actually what we see now when a few of the ships starts to operate again is that they only have 30 to 50 percent of the guests, you know, maximum allowance. That's right. Which means that it, it will not make sense on the long term to have a situation where we have the big ships but only 50 percent filled. Mm -hmm. Which means that the owners do not earn money. Mm, right. And what happens then? You know, what happens with the industry? Yeah, exactly. where, where are we going? It's not sustainable. No, it's not. What, what are your thoughts, Colin? Well, building, building a couple of small ships, uh, I think the trade-off there is perhaps a little smaller. <laughs> mm, mm. And, and uh, I'm kind of treading on, on, on the edge when I'm saying that, that uh, the, the small ones are beautiful ones right now. <laughs> I, but, I, but, I, I agree with you. I agree. And you're building smaller ones too. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, we had some other questions, but I, I think we're we're out of time for the questions. Our our, our uh, producer is uh, behind his mask, is giving me uh, angry eyes already that we are over time. We could talk forever with you, with yes. you gentlemen, but there are, there are great questions there, and I'm sure that uh, you're you're able to to work with uh, some of our people offline yeah. for some of the questions that they have. And if not, they can hire you. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the best way. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your insights. Thank, thank you. Very, thank, very you for you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're... Our third speaker today is uh, like his company. He is a master of safe people flow. With over 1 billion users of their products uh, every day, this company has gained exceptional insight on how to move people within buildings and ships safely. Contactless technologies, air and surface cleaning innovations, as we've heard from our uh, earlier speakers, are only some of the things that our next speaker will be talking about. And I'm really excited to hear uh, about this because this is in the context of elevators on board. So we welcome the head of sales at Kone, uh, who I believe is in Miami, Florida today. Lucky him, it's over 30 degrees uh, Celsius. Carlo Ricci. The virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be here. Good morning to, and good afternoon to everybody. So, um, firstly, very good uh, presentations. Very, hear, very good to hear from the speakers before me and very, very interesting topics. Um, firstly, I'd just like to just talk a little bit about um, our Kone and what our strategy is, what Kone are about. So on the left here, we are showing that's the, the world around us. So there's two mega trends that we base our strategy on. Uh, the first being urbanization, and then the second being technological disruption. So these are, the, these are the, the, the big topics that drive our need for change. Then we have on the right, we have our vision. How do we achieve, how do we achieve our vision? and our vision of the best people flow experience for elevator users. So we base our vision on uh, five strategic targets that we, that we base everything on, which is having the most loyal customers, uh, having a great place to work, 
faster market growth, best financial development, and being a leader in sustainability. But also, with part of our refreshed strategy is putting the customer at the center of our targets. So collaborating with our customers and really having a customer-centric solution so that we are developing solutions that customers actually need that is um, that is essential for their day, day, day-to-day business. So Kone's strategy in Marine is being a partnership of, during the lifetime of the vessel. So from early planning and design solutions, uh, we provide then innovate, innovative installation methods in shipyards around the world, giving a peace of mind then to the customers during the operation of their vessels with our global service network, right to the end of the lifetime of the equipment or to when late newer technology becomes available where we will provide modernization solutions to the elevators. So on today's topics then, so today, how can we help passengers and crew in today's COVID and tomorrow's post-COVID environments? So there's three main pain points that we are looking at and that we're going to talk about today. Um, the first, which being the main topic of our discussion, which is how can we contribute to healthier environments, optimizing people and material flow on board vessels? But then I will also just show some solutions that we are working on to, to look at to help these other pain points, such as reducing the need for passengers and crew to touch surfaces and also to prevent the spread of disease. So a little bit about the journey that takes place in defining people flow and defining people flow together with our customers. So as I said in, in the beginning with our strategy of being very customer centric, we want to understand what is working for the customer on board their existing vessels and how can we use that information to help them plan in the future, plan their future vessels, make, make the passenger experience better, but now make it also safer. So a big part of it and a key is early involvement. So early involvement in the design phase, uh, taking part in, in design workshops together with ship designers and the customer. From there, we provide traffic calculations, engineering solutions at the very, very beginning when we're on the drawing board. But then we, we take it a step of looking at customers' existing vessels. We go on board, we, 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 take, uh, we, we take surveys and gather data, collect measurements from onboard, uh, onboard operations in real time. Just to be sure, I think we dropped off here. Oh. Okay, we're back. Yep, so onboard, onboard information, so real data collected on, from, from, from passengers uh, onboard vessels. Taking all of this data and these calculations, we, then, we can then produce 3D simulations um, basically producing a test environment where we can work with the ship designers and the, and the ship owners to look at different scenarios, um, whether it be the number of elevators, are escalators required, are escalators not required, um, how passengers are uh, entering, if you use embarkation on, on the forward part of the vessel or the midship or, or the aft part of the vessel. So there's many, many different scenarios that we can actually simulate and one great thing is that we're actually using real data. So we're using real data from previous vessels to contribute to this. Then we move on to continued design support. So for the later stage of the, of the, of the design where we're looking at actual solutions. So let's, we're, we're taking, from looking at, taking data from the simulations and putting them to actual solutions and then implementing custom solutions based on the collaboration uh, within all parties. Next, then we look at the what is optimizing people flow. So in today's environment, 
what is safe and secure people flow. So Kone has 30 years marine experience where we've been optimizing solutions uh, based on different user groups, such as passengers, crew, and then material flow. So what is safe and secure people flow? So for years, we've worked close with the customers with onboard operations, getting these, get, getting passengers to their destination in the fastest time possible. But now the narrative has changed. Now we want to get passengers to their destination safely and, and safe in a secure manner. So we do not, we want to, we want to avoid large, large groups of people uh, traveling to be, traveling together in elevators. So there's some important factors that we need to take into account here. So uh, we look at this holistically rather than just only at vertical transports. Here we are looking at vertical and horizontal transports. And um, important factors that we look at is our, um, our swift ports and terminal embarkation. Uh, is there clear guidance on board for, for passengers to move flawlessly throughout the vessel? Can we reduce cross flow traffic within on the vessel in the elevator lobbies? Uh, we want to achieve passengers feeling safe and secure. So they feel that using an elevator is safe and secure for them. And then we have other safe travel guidelines now that, that come into place coming from our customers, from our own customers and from different, from, um, from, from um, different guidelines where we have um, elevator capacity. So what, what changes with the elevator capacity? And these are things that we need to take into account. So in the beginning, we, we look at, based on these guidelines, we calculate then the amount of persons allowed in an elevator. So taking into account physical distancing, we can then assess the demand for the elevators. This onboard, it can onboard occupancy be reduced uh, is what is the boarding rates during embarkation or dur uh, during uh, uh, port embarkation or disembarkation uh, what other on board activities cause crowding in the lobbies i.e dining uh, muster drills etc these are all these are all um, topics that we look at that we think that need to be managed how can these be managed so to not cause bottlenecks in the elevators or in the elevator lobbies. We also look at interfloor traffic between the, the different decks on board. Can this be reduced? Can we reduce the number of people entering the elevator while a, a particular passenger group are traveling to their destination? We also look at other items other than, than elevators. What other vertical transport options are available? Stairs. Um, we look at, in the design process, we look at, are stairs actually visible to passengers when they're in the elevator lobby? Do they know they have other options? If they are not visible, is there signage to show where the, where the stairs are, etc.? So these are all topics that we look at during our uh, design phase and, and to help with the whole holistic vertical transportation needs of a vessel. So using real data on board, we also can look at arrival rates. So taken from data that, from existing vessels or simulated data of a planned new vessel, we can look at these. And here is on this graph, it actually shows a typical home port uh, elevator traffic on a home port day on a typical cruise vessel, where you can see high peaks of elevator usage uh, in the morning for disembarkation. So then coming into the afternoon where we see peaks uh, during embarkation and that gradually then reduces throughout the day. So what these peaks actually mean, these peaks are actually meaning crowding. So a big part of what we can do in using this data is we can work with onboard operations on existing vessels or working on with, 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 with the ship owners for planned new vessels to look at how can we reduce this? How can we reduce this crowding from the operational point of view? Can we um, can you use different groups? Uh, can you direct passengers to different areas of the vessel 
in order to prevent large crowding in elevator groups. Then we look at technology. So what way, what way can Pune use technology to aid in physical distancing when it comes to the elevators? So we can reduce the full load limit of elevators by reducing the maximum weight allowed at an elevator. So basically this, what, what this would mean is that if, if uh, there is a weight restriction and only a certain number of passengers can, be, can use this elevator, the elevator not, will not run if the weight restriction is superseded. Then we can reduce the capacity of the, of the elevator using fill level sensors, which, which can be installed on elevator cab ceilings. And this allows, uh, this allows, again, the option to reduce the number of passengers allowed. So the elevator will not run if it has, uh, um, if it's gone over the maximum allowed persons that will be predefined into the software. And this can be changed throughout the cruise or throughout, uh, from cruise to cruise, depending on the situation um, that's in place. We also then have Pune destination control, which is um, where the passengers would select their destination before entering the elevator cabin. This offers a lot of options then to the cruise uh, to the cruise operators, as we can define then the number of passengers that are allocated to an elevator cabin. So basically, we can we the the, the elevator control will only allocate a number of passengers depending on what the requirements are from the from the from the ship owner then moving on to just some of our solutions that uh, we have in place then to reduce the need to touch surfaces so from our health and well-being solutions range we have um one where we have instead of the regular up and down call buttons we can install um foot kick plates so a passenger or crew member can use their foot to make the call uh, rather than using their hand and uh, spreading disease. Um, we also have the gesture landing call station where a passenger would make a gesture motion in the direction that they would like to travel. And the elevator will accept the call in that direction. But, but then we, we, we also have uh, app APIs that we can actually install on our crew, on let's say on a cruise customer's uh, very own application that they use for their passengers, where we can actually install software that would allow passengers to make an elevator call from their own mobile device. Again, this, uh, this will then remove the need to touch a call station, but even in this case, the passenger would already select their destination. So there is actually no need to touch uh, any call station outside the elevator and also inside the elevator. We also have, we are working now with many, many different solutions, uh, more than uh, I can share today, but there's some very, very interesting solutions that we have uh, ongoing, such as hologramic call stations. Um, not only are they, uh, do they look good or they could be, you know, interesting feature to have on board a vessel but again it removes that need to touch surfaces and then we have help help to spread uh, prevent spread of disease inside the elevator cabins and we've heard from the previous speakers a lot from already about um aerosol uh, transmission uh, air uv treated uh, air filtration so these are also technologies that can be adopted into the elevator installation also. So we have a range of different UVC solutions for treating elevator, um, for treating the elevators. And um, again, this needs to tie in with elevator software and sensors to prevent uh, persons being inside an elevator cabin before these uh, solutions can be activated. But these uh, UVC solutions are the most effective for killing viruses and bacteria. Then we have the air purification that's installed. It's not visible to passengers or crew, but it's installed within the elevator ceilings. And this recycles the air inside the elevator cabin. We then have antimicrobial handrails. So again, um, this 
touch points, so antimicrobial handrails that can be installed inside crew and passenger elevator cabins. And also for escalators, onboard escalators, where we have UVC handrail treatments, which are, are installed again inside the, the escalator. And this kills viruses and bacteria on, on the elevator, on the escalator handrails. So that is uh, basically it in a nutshell. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Carlo, for those very insightful technologies and procedures uh, that are part of our futures and in the people flow, uh, both off and on shore. Thank you very much, Carlo. But don't go anywhere, Carlo. Uh, don't go anywhere, Carlo, because we're going to be asking you some questions together with our next speaker. Okay? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our, our last uh, keynote today is. Um, He's a specialist of clean air and clean surfaces. We talked about this earlier, but he is a specialist of these, of these issues. He's worked uh, for the same company in the maritime industry for over 30 years. Uh, we welcome his experience, especially uh, his insight on the use of UV technology on ships. Please welcome, and I believe he's in Copenhagen, Denmark today, uh, the Director of Business Development at uh, Halton Marine, Henrik Hansen. Welcome, Henrik. Henrik, can you hear me? Microphone on. I, didn't have a microphone. I think that you have yeah. your microphone off. It's okay you now, my microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. The okay. virtual floor is yours, Henrik. Thank you very much. All uh, right. Very happy to be here. And it's very nice to hear the three other speakers talk so much about uh, air conditioning and uh, UV light. And uh, I will dig a little deeper into that. Uh, our company, Halson, have more than 50 years experience only working with uh, ventilation air conditioning and the vision and mission have always been the clave, clean and safe indoor air. So during these times, uh, we have two scenarios. We have all the cruise ships which is laid off and then we have all the, the, the new buildings uh, and of course uh, retrofit is much more complicated in, uh, with these uh, solutions and put them straight into uh, new uh, ships. We have worked with uh, UV light for more than 20 years and we have supplied to more than uh, 200 cruise ships. So it's nothing, nothing new for us and uh, UV light technology is nothing new either. Uh, you can say there are two methods uh, if you want to uh, get rid of uh, viruses. Either you can kill them or you can catch them. So when you, if you want to kill them, you're using UV light. And if you want to catch them, you need to have a trap. And that trap is called HIPAA filters. And both of them, uh, as we also heard from uh, our nice designers of ships, unfortunately, both of them, they will require uh, more power consumption. That's a fact. And that's the way it is. We have worked, uh, we have a medical department at Halton and uh, these, uh, some of these solutions have been developed for uh, operation rooms uh, in hospitals and then been developed, for instance, with a very famous hospital, Karolinska in, in Sweden. And so there's nothing new for us, but during these uh, pandemic times, we can use all these years experience in very, very high uh, uh, requirement uh, in environments to, to hopefully uh, help and get the ship sailing again, because that's what we all want to do. Cool. Yes, we have the WHO, uh, which of course collecting a lot of data. And uh, during the first uh, very, very heavy time in Italy, there was a lot of uh, investigation going on how this is spreading. And it was spreading, I found out, through the air and the air conditioning system, but also from surfaces, which we have heard about. This is very much divided into USA and to EU. So we have CDC in the USA and we have similar here, uh, European Center of Disease Control. And since we know this is spreading through air, we have uh, two organizations, one called ASRAE, that's the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration Engineers. And they put up guidelines and we have a similar in Europe, it's called REVA. And 
these two uh, institution they give guidelines and you can say to cut it very short the s-ray they're going very heavily for the uv uh, gi that's ultraviolet uh, geometrical irradiation so called uvc but this is a little different and the REVA go very much for the HEPA filtration, so catching the, the, the viruses. And as mentioned before, also we have we have to put into our mind that the air outside, that's a fresh air, that is clean. So what do we what do we really need to 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 work on? And that's the return air. If you have a recirculation system, that's the one you need to to, to clean. Uh, so, also mentioned before, somebody was asking social distancing, that is still the most important, but if you are in the places with the many, I don't know what is happening here. So, these are some of the factors uh, which have been uh, already proven into the, these are the facts coming from WHO and things like that. So, we're talking surfaces here and we will talk the aerosol uh, spreading. So here is uh, one of the, the laboratories we're having in Halson, and you can see we have a uh, knowledge about this, and we can we can measure and we measure in independent laboratories, and uh, these technologies uh, is is taken into our our system. If we're talking about the S-ray. What are they mentioning? They're mentioning the filtration, but basically UV GI devices, and that goes for the air handling, and it goes for upper room. That means you can have downlights to clean your surfaces, and it's portable units. And then they are talking about killing rate, and they're talking about log one, log two, and log three. So log one means that you're killing 90%, and then log two means you're killing 99%. So you can kill 90%, you would say, each time, because here we're talking about big airspeed or things like that. So if you're going for 99%, that's a double amount of money also and power consumption. And that's the same with, with log three. So that is three times as expensive than, than killing all, uh, that having a, a log one. And uh, that goes uh, into you need to have a, an exposure, uh, exposure time for this UV. You cannot just put up a lot of UV light in one place and full power because the airspeed and the uh, exposure time is simply too short. So they, they have rated these things and we have heard about a lot of, there's a lot of new, new things and old things, but the S-ray and the REVA, they only recognize filtration and UVC light. Uh, there's a lot of uh, other things, photocatalytic uh, and all kinds of things, but according to these two, these are well proven and uh, technologies, and that's what they go with. We have a, a mobile mobile unit which can uh, clean uh, the air inside, and this is one is using a, a HEPA filter. And many times, if you put a HEPA filter into your normal uh, air conditioning system, you will have a huge uh, pressure loss. And of course, the filter is catching a lot of other particles also, meaning the pressure loss is getting bigger and bigger. And then, okay, what can you do? You can change the filter. But if you have a normal HEPA filter, uh, it's not sure that the viruses, they are dead. So it's, sometimes it's not so good to change the filter if it's not educated personal changing the filter in the room you want to to have clean because then you can suddenly spread a lot of viruses if you have not killed them and uh, of course with the with the system already existing it's a big problem to put in a uh, HEPA filter the, in existing uh, air conditioning because they are not the dimension for that so the fans cannot run faster uh, or the, you cannot have if you run them faster you use more electricity and maybe the wiring is not even made for that so there's no no easy easy thing here, but of course if you take a portable in with a with a built-in fan, you are not uh, putting extra stress on your existing uh, system. So that is uh, one solution. 
And then when you want to change the filter, you go, can take it into a, a safe room and, and do it there because many times it's it's not so good to change the filter in the in the room you really want to have uh, to want to have clean. That's yeah, just the basics. But the ultraviolet light is is nothing new, and it have also been uh, used in air handling units for a long time on the on the cooling coil, and that have been in order to to avoid spores and other kind of uh, bacteria uh, which uh, which can uh, grow there. The, the place, and I also think you have to think about is uh, is, uh, is is safety, because it has to be placed the right place, and it always has to be placed in the return uh, air system, as we spoke before. The uh, outside air or the, should be should be clean. And it's not only where you place it, you also have to have uh, exposure time. And that's why you cannot just hang them on one, one big row and put a lot uh, of, of power on that, because you will simply not have Joel enough uh, to kill the, the viruses. It needs uh, time, and we all know on air conditioning on ships, we have small dots and a lot of speed. So that's not good. Another thing which you have to think about, that's the creation of ozone. Because you can buy a lot of different kinds of UVC light and some of them produce a lot of ozone. And ozone is not very healthy for the human lungs and things like that. You will create asthma and a lot of other things. So you really have to use very low emitting UVG eye lamps and you have to control the ozone level. Another thing also, you should not look into these uh, light bulbs. You will get like welding eyes, so it's not good for that either. Another thing is that a lot of material, these things uh, attack everything which is uh, with CH, uh, so everything organic, and we know like plastic, there's oil in plastic, and so it's, if it's not UV resistant plastic, it will also slowly start to eat the plastic. So there's a lot of things to think about safety functions so people cannot look into that. And uh, it also requires a lot of engineering uh, compared to uh, to HIPAA filter, where to, to put these things. Uh, here you see just uh, some uh, some of the, the formulas used when you're putting these into the, to the dot system. So it's not uh, something everybody can do and we have Luckily in Halson, we have doctors and professors who have worked with this for, for many, many years. What we have of standard solution, let's say not to putting into the, to the dot system, because that really have to be calculated uh, seriously, is the three uh, different uh, kinds, and that is covering most of the areas that also some of the former speakers spoke about. We have a, a mobile filtration unit. And in this filtration unit, we also have UV light. So at the same time, we are having a, a HIPAA filter. We also have a light, so we are killing the, the bacteria inside the, the when we have caught, catch them. Then we have a, a return air grill. So because it can be a big problem, especially on existing ships, to get into the docks, to get space for that, you have to cut down a lot of insulation, things like that. So we have return air grill with a built-in UV light. And then we have a, a, a third one also, and that is uh, what we call overhead lightning. And that is for cleaning surfaces, as we heard from Kona before. This is typically a thing you can do also, so every time, but you have to be sure there's nobody inside the elevator. You put that one for a couple of minutes, and then the surfaces will be free of uh, viruses and bacteria, in fact, also. But that's something you have to control. So shortly, this one you can you can move around and of course that that gives a little uh, saving also if you if you want to clean uh, one room you put that in the room and then uh, you clean that and then you can even move it to another room so that is a very uh, very flexible uh, solution and here you see uh, uh, exhaust uh, unit and that one can also uh, be, be supplied with uh, with the built-in uh, fan, so we doesn't uh, put too much pressure on the system uh, already. Uh, and the last solution, that is the overhead lightning. 
The good thing with surfaces, they stay the same place and not travel uh, by air that we have. So here we don't need so much power compared to what we need inside the air handling units or in the return air system, because here the surfaces are, are staying in the same place. And for instance, to clean textile or things like that, it's very difficult for the, for the cleaning lady. But if you put UV light on, you can see after uh, five minutes, you have, uh, you have cleaned uh, all the surfaces that you can see. But of course, if somebody come and put, put a book on the table, then that's not cleaned uh, under the, the, the table. So that was uh, in 15 minutes uh, uh, what I could uh, speak about. There's a lot, a lot of uh, things to think about when we're doing these things. And it's good we have engineering offices also like Forsy because it's, it's not just to go out and buy some UV bulbs in China and then put them in. It's not going to work. So that was basically about my 15 minutes and that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Henrik, for that great presentation. You're Gentlemen, welcome. I'd like to, to uh, take some of the questions that were posed by the audience to both of your presentations. If I may, I'll have only a couple of questions since we, uh, we need to continue with our program uh, with our, our last speaker today, Ula Lainio. Uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I've got uh, your questions and thank you for being so incredibly active. But I'd like to, to take maybe to combine two questions uh, and this one is perhaps more for Carlo. If, if stricter elevator capacity restrictions are implemented, what are some solutions to decrease the increased crowding, queuing in the elevator lobbies? This was from uh, to Bilen and uh, a, 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 related, a, a related question for you, uh, Carlo, also is, what about buttons action by the foot? Robust, safe, and cheap. Any thoughts? Yes, yes, exactly. So um, very good question. So for on the first question, um, a big part of, um, if there is social distancing or, or physical distance restrictions in place, um, we really need to look at more the operational side from the vessel. So how are people, flow, how is people flow coming into the lobbies? So if the, we have to look at where are the bottlenecks, are the bottlenecks at the elevator lobby, at the elevators, or are they at, let's say, a security x-ray machines, etc. cetera. Um, so a big part to mitigate that issue would have to come from onboard operations. Um, uh, for instance, uh, guiding passengers to other parts of the vessel. So there's never only one elevator group, especially on the larger cruise ships, but there's, you usually have two at least two elevator banks. So if you can guide people either to other parts of the area, other parts of the vessel, or to use stairs, etc., this is um, uh, going to play an important part of uh, basically avoiding crowds in the lobby. Yeah. Um, on the second question then regarding the kick, uh, the, the kick plates, yes, exactly. Kick Kone actually, um, as part of our door business on land side, um, we installed doors and hermetically sealed doors in very sensitive areas, especially in hospitals and in surgical areas. And uh, Kone had produced um, kick switches that can be used in, instead of surgeons or um, other medical staff having to use uh, touch, having to press buttons to open up these doors. So we have we have now taken this technology and these kick plate technologies, very simple technology, and we've brought this now on as part of our elevator offering on both land side and on in marine. So this is a very good, a simple solution to avoid touch uh, touch points for passengers and Thank crew. You. Thank you, Carlo. And for you, Henrik, we have uh, several questions and perhaps you want to go later and, and answer many of them. Uh, very good questions, but I'll take only one here is the uh, HVAC systems on board are also part of the, uh, of the firefighting and the fire protection with the overpressurizing cabins and staircases. Are there any issues with the redesign for virus spread minimizing? You can say, uh, especially in, 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 especially, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we hear you. 
Okay, so of course, uh, especially if you have somebody who is contaminated with COVID-19, yeah. uh, here you don't want to overpressurize, you want to have an underpressure. So let's say in the hospital or in some cabins, if you have people who have COVID-19, the only way to make sure it stays in that room is to have an underpressure. So yeah. it's a little uh, different and of course uh, the HVAC is a big impact to the to the firefighting, uh, but also if we looking in the corridors, if we're using displacement ventilation, uh, that will make a safe way out because uh, the smoke will go up and the, the same way you can do with, uh, with viruses. So instead of having mixing ventilation all around the ship, it would be much better to use uh, displacement ventilation, but that's something four ships have to work with. Thank you, Henrik, for that. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you both for excellent presentations. Thank you ever so much. And all the best of luck to both of you. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we close our event uh, by giving the virtual floor to the head of Smart Mobility. Um, uh, at uh, Business Finland. Uh, she could not join us uh, live, but she is there at a safe distance in her home studio. I'd like to give the floor to Ula Lainio. Please. Uh, many thanks, uh, Andre. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much uh, for great presentations today, dear company representatives. Uh, it's now time to uh, summarize this uh, webinar. As we have heard today, since uh, the outbreak of the pandemic in spring, the Finnish uh, marine and health uh, industries have very quickly started to develop new uh, technologies, solutions to mitigate the pandemic. Finland has very strong industries, marine, health and digital uh, technologies. And um, Finland is in the forefront uh, of uh, developing um, new medicine and, uh, and uh, treatment towards uh, COVID-19. Finland has one of the strongest healthcare systems in the world. We are now in the process of bringing these same technologies to the marine industry. Today we heard about the innovations from Finland. We are very well aware that uh, the marine industry, the cruise lines, they need uh, solutions technologies and new ways of working that can be implemented right away into their existing fleet. And uh, marine industry also needs uh, solutions that can be implemented in, in the longer term uh, because uh, the passenger behavior uh, will change. It has changed and uh, there is a need for increased uh, health and safety measures. Here it goes. Okay, right. Uh, like uh, Mr. Rodkir Kalle in the first presentation pointed out, we have uh, published late June or mid June uh, brochure on uh, safe and clean ships and ports solutions from Finland. So this uh, brochure is addressed uh, to uh, the marine industry, ship owners, uh, naval fleet operators, port operators and uh, technology providers. Uh, here you will, um, I show you the place where to find it. You can find this brochure on uh, Business Finland's website. You can also find it on Finnish Marine Industries website. Um, now um, people have asked, what, 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 are, what are you doing next? So we at Business Finland, we are of course following the situation, how it develops uh, uh, very, very closely. Our um, aim is to arrange a webinar like this, Held at C3 uh, webinar uh, later this fall. And um, in that upcoming uh, webinar, we aim to uh, present more solutions for uh, safe uh, ships and ports and uh, and also we, we we intend to present the Finnish uh, innovation ecosystems that are focusing on 
uh, developing this, uh, this theme. Um, the Business Finland uh, is, uh, is um, the funder, so we fund uh, business ecosystems. And, uh, and now we are inviting uh, companies and research uh, organizations uh, from Finland and from abroad uh, to, to join these innovation ecosystems. And we are, we are going to tell more about them in the, in the next webinar. So, uh, dear participants, uh, you who, who, who are listening to this webinar today, you will be invited to the upcoming next webinar. And um, we will also post, uh, post it, the next webinar on Business Finland's uh, LinkedIn, uh, on Business Finland's website and on Finnish Marine Industries' websites. So you will be informed. Um, I will end my presentation here. Uh, I hope you have found this webinar useful. Uh, thanks for joining. And uh, now I pass it over to, to uh, Andre. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you very much business to Business Finland, Finland and, uh, and uh, to, the, to the, marine the Marine Industries of Finland, Finland for the collaboration for the and our wonderful team here. Wonderful production team have done a really great job and all our speakers, and but especially to all of you. All of you have done such a, a tremendous, a tremendous job uh, putting on th this second webinar on the topic of health at sea. Very excited about uh, seeing all of you in the third edition of this great webinar. Be safe at sea, everybody.